Welcome aboard, folks. We are very proud to share that your pilot is the most diverse pilot on record. She is a three foot two inch pansexual Native American man who identifies as a six foot tall Korean woman. Remember to keep a whisper volume level as she may have to consult instructional videos as a refresher during the flight. Guys, welcome to Better Bachelor. My name is Joker with a face for radio and a voice for print. Uh, the college, military, airlines, all for women and diversity and inclusion. And it's basically coming around now to where before companies were just struggling with their bottom line. And now it's actually getting to the point where uh, companies are failing. Airlines are falling apart, literally. Their planes are falling out of the air. And the military has missed recruiting, and if we have to go into conflict, it's going to turn out very, very poorly. It's an interesting time that we're living in. I, I have to give it that much. As much as, we, uh, as much as we shake our heads and just go about our days, there's actually very monumental change happening in the world right now, most of it for the worse. And when we talk about you know weak men making bad times, we're in a place where not only Weak men are making bad times, but the weak men are following what the weak women want. And they're trying to capitulate and give in to what these women are screaming and hollering for, and they're giving in. And this is going to be the world's greatest and awful, also worst experiment on how we're not the same. Men and women are not the same. Different things drive us. We think and operate in different ways. And if we keep going this track, Things are going to fall apart very quickly. Now, more than likely, our, our, our power grids at some point, our water stations are going to go down because the guys that built them and engineered them and knew how to manually operate them, they're gone. And now you got a bunch of computers controlling everything. And when those computers fail or an EMP blast you know, goes off or a, a bug, a virus gets into the system, that's it. You're not going to have any fuel for a long time. If you remember a couple of years ago, I was traveling across the country in my bus and uh, diesel fuel disappeared from the southeast of the United States because Russian hackers hit a hit a either a processing plant or a distribution center. And they said, well, the, the computers are offline and we can't manually do it anymore because the guys that know how to do that are, are all retired or have expired like they're not around anymore. And we didn't learn how to do that. And they ended up paying the ransom to Russia just to get the system back up and running. What happens when everything's like that? Well, women have gotten in and now they're in charge of the, of the military along with guys that think they're women. Now women, for the mass, vast majority of colleges, women run the panels and they're the college, uh, the head of college, the dean or whatever the hell they call them. I don't know, I'm not a college, four-year college man myself. And now they're getting into the airlines as engineers and mechanics and pilots. These are a few of the ways that things are starting to break down. Uh, this is in an interview. Uh, and, and this is with uh, the, I think he's the CEO of, he's either of, I think he's United Airline. We're going to listen to this. It's only about a minute long. I want you to hear what his, what's important for them to hire. If I'm a business and... I fly millions and millions of people around the globe every day or so, and there's millions of planes in the air. If you ask me, well, what's important to you? It would be having the best mechanics and the best engineers and the best people at the flight control towers and the best pilots and a ground crew that works well and is efficient and is intelligent and knows what they're doing and is able to keep us in the air safely. That's not the priority of these companies anymore. Uh, here, here let, let's let the CEO ramble. How is diversity and diversity targets working into the Aviate Academy? We have committed that 50% of the class of, of the classes will be women or people of color. Uh, today, only 19% of our pilots at United Airlines are women or people of color. And by the way, from all the data I've seen, that's the highest of any airline in the country. White males don't just dominate in the cockpits, also in the C-suite at United Airlines. Well, look, at United, I'm proud of the diversity that we actually have in our, our C-suite. I think if you look around corporate America. Correct me if I'm saying though, so I, this is just based off your website, the people you list as executives, but out of 11 people, three are women. I believe one is a person of color. Um, that's correct. Um, 
but you know in corporate america i think you know that's a low bar how do you yeah. ra- he says that's a low bar 75 percent of america is white at least uh, i think i have this statistic here this is from the united states census as of 2020 so it's it's relatively uh population 334 million they say a uh, white alone percent 75.5 so if we're he says that the 19 percent of the airline pilots and c-suite which i don't know what that means maybe that's the engineers or whatever that he says 19 percent are women and, and people of color okay well if if white people make up 75.5 percent of the population that leaves 25 percent that is non-white so then you say well out of those 25 percent left over we've got 19 percent that's representing us in the airline as okay that's a pretty close percentage to what the actual population of the united states in is now once you mix in women and other things yes that would would throw the percentage off a little bit but how many women are just hoping so badly to become pilots and engineers and mechanics not too many not too many so the interviewer says that's a low bar when in reality it's not and and it's not to say that women can't become engineers and that you know black guys or hispanics or what they aren't mechanics and engineers it's not to say that they aren't or they shouldn't be or they can't but the point is they're trying to over represent what the actual population is and when you do that you have to sacrifice on the quality of people that you're selecting you're not selecting the best of the best mathematically uh you're going to see the effects of this here uh, pretty quickly i'll let him finish out this interview raise your own bar well, a lot of this is, you know, focusing on it. We have uh, programs to, one of the things we do is for every job when we do an interview, we require women and people of color to be involved in, in the interview process, bringing people in early in their careers um, as well, uh, and giving them those opportunities uh, and creating a stronger band. So it's not important that they have qualified people interviewing the people that are coming in. It's important to have diversity when we interview. When I was a network engineer, we were probably 95% dudes. I'd say 25, per, like we had, I don't know, 10 or 10 or 15% that was maybe black and Hispanic. Uh, we had probably 30, 35% that were white. And then we had like 25% Indian and 25% Asian, mostly Chinese guys. Those were engineers, why? because men from those countries and men in general that was what was important to them is to become engineers it was to become successful to make good money and it was something that they were passionate about when we had an applicant that came in that was a woman's name we didn't say oh we got a woman uh oh guys come on let's not even interview her nope our management team was like hey you know what it wouldn't hurt it wouldn't hurt to have some women at least here to Maybe they have different ideas. That was something that we actually did discuss. Now, hindsight's twenty twenty, but when we interviewed them, we'd ask them very tough questions and they would have CCIE, which is Cisco certified, different uh, Cisco certifications. We'd ask them questions that were on the certificate or on the, um, on the tests for, to get certified. We'd ask them just simple things. And a lot of times they didn't know. They didn't know. So even though they had the the prerequisites and the classes and the certificates, they didn't have the answers to what we needed to know. But then we'd inter- got interview a guy that knew a ton about Linux, but never finished college because he was a basement nerd, you know, nothing against basement nerds. And he would answer everything we asked and then some. Like he, he, he knew a lot more than they did because he had an interest in it and he learned and he spent the time on youtube versus well, i don't really have any interest in this but i'll go sit through the classes and barely pass the test so that i can get a job with 120 grand a year salary that's the difference between this stuff and i think if culture changes a little bit yes you could get uh different groups more interested in engineering and things like this but they're not going to get it off TikTok. the faa uh, their diversity push includes focus on hiring people with severe intellectual and psychiatric disabilities. I don't know about you, but I don't want somebody that is sitting in the air traffic control tower 
or working around an airport with baggage and, and other things that are critical to making the infrastructure work. I don't want them having severe intellectual and psychiatric disabilities. Maybe that's just me. The Federal Aviation Administration is actively recruiting workers who suffer from severe intellectual disabilities, psychiatric problems, and other mental and physical conditions under a diversity and inclusion hiring initiative spelled out on the agency's website. Targeted disabilities are those federal government as a matter of policy is identified for special emphasis in recruitment and hiring. They state that includes hearing and vision, missing extremities, partial paralysis, complete paralysis, epilepsy, severe intellectual disability, psychiatric disability, and dwarfism. Although I don't think, I think they like to be called little people now. I don't know. Look, here's, I have no problems with hearing, vision, uh, missing a limb, partial paralysis, like maybe you're a para or quadriplegic, uh, complete paralysis, uh, paralysis, and epilepsy. I have no problems with those. But when you start getting into people that are unhinged, literally unhinged, or they're intellectually challenged to the point where they can't even do whatever job, and if they make a mistake, people, planes could fall out of the air. That's not good. The FAA, now remember the FAA, okay, this is our government, the Federal Aviation Administration. This is the current administration and previous administrations, but they're the ones putting these people that are making these policies in place. So when you say, oh, I don't want to talk about politics, politics really doesn't have a plane falling out of the sky because a mechanic forgot to tighten down the bolts on one of the panels on the side of the plane. That's what happened to Alaska Airlines. The person that hired that person is part of the FAA's diverse, etc. in this. They say the FAA, which is overseen by Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Department of Transportation. Now, what's his, what's his credentials to be in charge of the, DO, the Department of Transportation? He was a mayor that couldn't get potholes filled in like, I don't know, Indianapolis or Indiana or someplace, and, but he's gay. So we need to make him part of this administration for representation. And here's the window that they were talking about. Notice it's not just the window that got blown out. It is the whole panel of the plane. It wasn't bolted in properly. They say a missing door plug. So if you if some on some planes, they would put a door here, and then they don't have these row of seats here, and then people could board the plane or exit the plane here. And if you if you fly overseas a lot, you'll notice that they just land on the runway. Like when I landed in Peru, they land on the, the runway. They open the front of the plane. They open the back of the plane, and they're like, get off. And they dump you onto the, the, like the side of the runway, and then you walk all the way to the, to the terminal. Here in the United States, you get on the front, you get off the front, and you're, you're dropped off and picked up at the terminal itself. Big difference. But these planes are sold all over the place, so they have different configurations. Just some loose bolts does this to a plane. Do you think, do you think I, I'm more concerned with what color the person that bolts the things on, or do I care about them being the best of the best? I don't care if the best of the best is a three and a half foot tall dude that thinks he's a girl um, and, I don't know, is purple. I don't care as long as that person is the best of the best doing this. But when that's not the focus, this is what you get. Uh, Matt commentator, uh, Matt Walsh said, the DEI rot in the airline industry is way worse than you think. He wrote in an op-ed last week. Critics such as commentary have pushed back on the argument that prior to prioritizing DEIs made traveling less safe with civil rights groups slamming Musk for ab the abhorrent and pathetic. Well, you can call it abhorrent and pathetic all you want, but when you start posting things like this more and more, it's going to continue to get called out. This is a post that came out last night, breaking report. Uh, and this is from the 19th. So this was this morning at 1.50 a.m., so roughly 12 hours ago from me recording this. Breaking report, Atlas Air Boeing 747 from Miami International Airport catches fire midair. And this is a developing story. Uh, I want you to hear the audio on this because this is just a gal standing outside of her apartment or whatever. And she's like, holy crap, that plane is on fire. And it just took off from Miami International. It's not coming in for a landing. It's taking off. I don't hear any audio from this. Let me look at my settings. 
Yeah. Anyway, she's standing out there and she's like, oh my God. Oh my gosh, this plane, it's on fire. This plane's on fire. They have the video here. Oh my. Oh, this has audio. Okay, we'll play it here. Oh my God, it's on fire. Oh my God. I'm sorry. It's on fire. Mom. So, oh, and if you see me sipping out of a, a salsa jar here, you know, I'm not drinking salsa. I'm drinking my coffee. Uh, but I'll tell you a good hint. Uh, if you don't want to pay for dishware like glasses now, you go to buy a decent tumbler. I don't know, they're three, four, five bucks. Uh, just whatever you drink your, or whatever you get your salsa or your whatever things in a glass jar, keep the lid, keep the jar, take the label off. It makes a nice little mug that's microwavable, and then you can also seal it with the lid. And uh, you get a glass, and you get food, and you get a container all in one. Just a little. So I just haven't taken the label off of this yet. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, they say flames. And this is, again, last night. Flames seen shooting out from Boeing 747 flight over Miami. Video on social media. Flames apparently coming out from a Boeing plane shortly after takeoff. The brief clip captured by someone on the ground shows uh, flames trailing an Atlas air flight minutes after it took off. Um, that was heading to Puerto Rico when it was diverted. Officials said the cargo flight landed safely at Miami Airport just after 10.30 p.m. after engine failure. Um, Boeing 747, they kind of say the same thing there. Incident came as Boeing faces increasing scrutiny after a Boeing uh, 737 MAX 9 plane uh, was forced to make an emergency landing on January 5th after a panel blew out of the side of the plane shortly after takeoff over Portland, Oregon. So this plane here is a Boeing 747. Now, airlines, you know, like United Airlines and other places, yes, they do have to do maintenance on the plane. But maintenance shouldn't be tightening the bolt of the skin of the plane. And that's what they blame this on, that the bolts weren't tightened properly. Well, you know, if Crippy McGee mentally challenged and or crazy person decides it's funny or doesn't want to or doesn't pay attention enough to bolt down the side of the plane and you get a blowout like this like you look at this seat dude it is like pulled over towards the exit so is this one where that started to peel open i don't know if about you but i like we're starting to enter hollywood movie nightmare uh the the ntsb is investigating with a probe focusing on the uh, plugs used to fill spots for extra doors when those exits are not required this is about the other plane there not the one that just was in sparks earlier this week boeing named kirkland donald a retired navy admiral as special advisor to lead a comprehensive quality review of the company's quality management system for commercial airplanes okay so we're not going to care about what happens as until something bad happens and then it's all all hands on board. Do you guys remember the train that derailed in, in, in Palestine, Ohio? Or Palestine, I think they actually pronounce it down there. Do you remember that happening? Do you remember the warehouse that, that uh, uh, blew up? So it was somewhere up north. And it was a refinery. Do you remember the train that derailed that had toxic chemicals? I think that was in Texas somewhere. Now, don't, you know, I know... There were a bunch of train derailments over the last year or so, and they were on the news, and they were big chemical spills. Do you remember hearing what happened about that? Nothing. Do you remember about the train companies holding people accountable? Nope. Pete Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg being held accountable, overseeing things. He didn't even go down and visit until after President Trump went down there, and President Trump's not even in office. Biden never went because they don't care, because no one's held accountable for anything. So when there's no accountability, and you've got people that are mouth breathers putting things together, but they've got the right whatever attributes, LDHD TV or LGHD TV, whatever, this is what you're going to get. This is and, and until things absolutely bottom out and collapse, nothing's going to be done about it. That's why things are going to have to get really, really bad before they get better. And we're, we're just starting into the decline. And the New York Post from Mike Avila, why airplane crashes are now safer than ever. And this is published uh, six days ago. So now they're trying to convince you, well, plane crashes don't happen. You know, you know how this goes. 
Plane crashes don't happen that often. Well, you're just overinflating the number of plane crashes. You're worrying too much. You're focusing on it too much. Well, plane crashes do happen, but now they're safer in, than ever. And then the next part is B, why airplane crashes are good. Because it helps, I don't know, airlines learn what to fix. I, who knows? You know how this goes. I'm not even going to read this story. You don't need to. But they're going to start coming out with these... Uh, Oh, right. Here's another one. Over 300 passengers miraculously make it out alive after Japan Airlines plane catches fire after possible midair collision. I don't I don't I haven't seen this video. I don't even know if it's something I can click on. It doesn't look like it. There's a fire. Uh oh, another plane goes down. This is a good thing. It's OK. Don't worry about it, guys, because we have the right people. We have we have diverse people that are in charge of this stuff. It's OK. Don't stop worrying about it. Um, this is from Bloomberg. Corporate America pledged to hire more people of color. It actually did. Now, again, I don't want anybody to ever think that I have a, a problem with people of anything getting hired for any reason if they're qualified. But, but you can't have 75% of people being white and 6% of them are what was hired. And then the small demographic of whatever's the left over there, uh, 25, 30% of people making up 95% of the hires. You, you mathematically are not getting the best of the best people. Change of employment since February 2020. White people are a million down. Everybody else is way, 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 way up. Data is not seasonally adjusted. And this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this is a sensitive topic that people, when, when anybody broaches it, God forbid, if they're a white, straight male like I am, we're called all the names. But it just has to, it has to do with mathematics and people's skills and abilities. You can't take, if 80% of the people, here, I'll put it to you this way. If 80% of the people are pink and 20% are blue, yet you hire, uh, all the people you hire are 90% four percent blue there's a problem there take take everything you just mathematically aren't getting the best and the same thing now is happening in the military and it's this youngest generation you know a lot of gen z is more conservative than uh the millennials are and gen alpha might be even more so because they're starting to make fun of this stuff they realize it's a goof but here's the military Gen Z U.S. soldiers engaged in TikTok mutiny, discouraging Army recruits. See, when you don't join, when I was in the military, I did it for two reasons. Number one, right fresh out of high school, I went to college. I did a couple of semesters. My grades were pretty good. I just was kind of burnt out on school. I said, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to sit in a classroom all day just sitting and listening. I want to do something. I want to go out there. I, 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 I want to have a car like a nice car. I want to get a girlfriend. I want to make some income. I don't want to be a student for another two to four years. That's just what felt right to me. Not everybody feels that way. But I said, hey, you know what? I went out and tried to get a decent job. I didn't have any like real world skills yet. And so I joined the military and my father had been in the military. My grandfather had been in the military. And I said, you know, something? I think my dad was in during, um, let's see, he was born in the 40s. I think he was in in the late Korean War or very early Vietnam War. And, he, you know, he served just a couple of years. He didn't see any combat or anything like that. But he did his time in the military. And I said, you know, maybe this is a good way for me to go. I signed up. I knew it was going to be the crap because my dad told me it's, it's crap. I'm like, just so you know. But you'll get some experience and you do support the country. And you know what? He was right. Uh, they're don't, like, follow the rules, even if they don't make sense, because it's the way we've done it for 30 years. Also, the food is horrible. Uh, also, the schedules are horrible. But the women that live around military towns are crazy. So maybe that's an uptick. I mean, crazy, like crazy fun and easy. But now, now when you don't have any pride, you don't have, you're just, well, it's a job and they keep recruiting me because they don't apparently want white people anymore. Now, what are you getting? You're getting a bunch of people that don't want to be there that are saying to everybody else of their own age, don't come. Don't come. Uh, young members of the U.S. Army are throwing a TikTok mutiny to complain about the crappy food being pushed to stay in shape, their freedoms being suppressed, and more. 
That See, that's obviously, they don't know anything about the military. Uh, one of the videos by military influencer. <laughs> wait, hold on. Oh, wait, you serious? Uh, uh, Anthony Lasseter, Laster described his life as having no privacy, the pay sucks, crappy food, disrespectful leadership, and no sleep. Welcome to the military. See, the, because if you go into combat, you know what you're not going to have? You're not going to have any privacy. You're not, your pay, but it won't matter because you have no, nothing to spend your money on. The, you're going to have probably C rations or, or uh, uh, MREs, so, which is a meal ready to eat, which is eh, about 1,800 calories, but there's some of them that are pretty crappy. Um, the leadership doesn't care if they respect you or not. You, you are a unit. You're not a human being. You're a person. You're a unit. You're a pawn on the chessboard. Shut up and do what I say. And no sleep, yeah, because when you're in combat, you might be 42 four or 48, 72 hours without sleep. And and they're going to get out there and whine. Look at this, and this. Look, I knew a couple of dudes like him, a little overweight, like not in the best shape. If you're in basic, you can't get away with this kind of weight, but maybe he's been around for a while. Uh, they say the post has been viewed over 600,000 times since 2020. Laster has more than a million followers on TikTok and made the disparaging comments about the military, not only while in uniform, but while on mission. In other posts viewed by the Daily Mail, the Chicago native claimed that he spent the whole day watching TikTok videos while supposedly fighting the Taliban. But the army expects to end it, uh, the army expects to end up about 15,000 short of its target, 65,000 recruits for 2023, the outlet reported. Similarly, the Navy experts to fall short about 10,000 Air Force to miss its goal by 10%. Gen Z apparently appears to be full of complaints about the military as an increasing number take part in what the publication describes as a TikTok mutiny. Another young soldier influencer named Shamar Williams told his 34,000 followers his top five reasons not to join the military. And he did though this in uniform while appearing on base. I can tell you right now, if this happened, like social media wasn't around when I was uh, in the military. If you did this, uh, you'd probably uh, you'd probably be removed from the military. You'd probably get a court martial. They'd find a reason to give you a court martial. Now they might not lock you up, but they would definitely give you a dishonorable discharge. Now they can't do that. Why? Because no one's signing up for the military anymore, and the people that are are crappy. Do you think if this guy up here is complaining about the food and complaining about the lack of privacy and complaining about all the things, do you th and, and all he did while they were supposedly fighting other people was sit around watching TikTok, do you want this guy having your six when you go into combat? I don't know about you, but I don't. I don't want this guy watching my back. Uh, don't join the army until you're mentally prepared uh, to be told that you're over underweight, treated like you're not a good soldier, even if... Even if you can't run two miles in 18 minutes or less, that's a nine minute mile. Uh, oh, and you can't get injured either because then it's your fault. Well, yes, welcome to the military. Uh, over 60% of active duty service members are overweight or obese. Uh, now, I've done other videos about this. First, they drop, they drop the physical requirements. Then they drop the weight requirements. Then they drop the mental aptitude requirements. Then they take people with, I don't know, uh, other mental issues and, and then they go around and drop it and drop it and drop it again and drop it again and drop it again eventually you're going to have the dregs filling our military we are not the same force and and it's the same in the uk i'm sure it's the same in australia but this is what happens when when you're not recruiting the people that actually care about our country and actually want to do the right thing because as the telegraph states here and this is from yesterday you notice how all of this stuff is like within the last week or two. What, uh, from the Telegraph, white men no longer want to fight for a nation that scorns them. If you can't recruit among the largest group, you won't have enough people. The largest group in America, as I said from the census, 75% white. Which statistically, if you, if you basically break that down as half and half, that's what, 37% 37, 37 are dudes, white dudes? That's a third of your country. And you're telling them that they're worthless and they're hopeless and you don't want them and you don't care about them and they're dregs to society. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to say, you know what, I'll just be a basement dweller. I'll make some money at a job that I enjoy, hang out with my friends and, oh, well. He says, let me begin by making this point as clearly as possible. 
There's absolutely nothing worse for combat effectiveness of a military than attempting to use recruiting as a social engineering program. It was reported in the newspaper recently how U.S. Army has seen a dramatic fall in the number of recruit, white recruits specifically. Underpinning this drop was dramatic increase in white recruits from 44,000 to 25,000. So they had a drop of basically 20,000 people. And how, how far short did they fall of their enlistment target? 10,000. So dudes are walking away. Um, they say uh, leading to the proportion of white recruits falling from 56 to 44%. So even that is an underrepresentation of white people, but more white men sign up for the military. They say, according to the U.S. Census from 2022, around 59% of all U.S. citizens were from white backgrounds. The U.S. military, 17% women. So the recruiting crisis is primarily one um, amongst white men. Clearly, inside something inside the U.S. Army's recruitment system is failing in both terms of targets being drastically missed and a failure to recruit effectively among the nation's largest, largest ethnic group. The U.K. armed forces are in similar depressing situation. Recruiting targets are consistently not met. But the main priority is not to get more people to join up. It's to get more non-white people and women to join up. What's what's the way I like to phrase this and, and this just and I phrase it this way to be a smart ass. It's not that I actually want this to happen. The military is saying we don't want white men to die in war. We want to protect those men. So we'd rather, rather fill our ranks with women and minorities because they're useless. Now, me saying that would probably get a lot of people very angry, but it's all how you phrase things. They're saying we want diversity. We want people that are not normally represented in the military. Okay, but what's the military mostly used for? Isn't it to defend our country and, and go to battle? And if things go real south, to ultimately give your life for the country? Yes. Okay, so you want more... You want more people that have skin color and more women to fight and possibly get ended in a battle. Well, no, but well, I'm just saying. See, they phrase it they, because they phrase it like a way that it's a positive. But if you ask me if the military really didn't like white dudes, they'd, they'd specifically be asking for a bunch of white dudes. And then if we go into conflict, they're like, well, it's just white guys that are dying. Who cares? That with that, I mean, you see where I'm coming from on this stuff. They say the failure to meet recruiting targets is one thing. Peddly, peddling politically motivated and deeply flawed ideology driven quotas is quite another. I, I don't look when I was in sir, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but you get you guys get it. When I was in the military, what mattered? I we were all over the rainbow on this stuff. Now, granted, we didn't have a ton of women, but we had a couple of women in there. We were all over the rainbow when it came to, to backgrounds and nationality. Some of the dudes like had real strong Spanish accents because they came from a Spanish uh, family. Some dudes were from like rough parts in the Bronx. It was a buddy of mine, two guys, two guys that were really good friends of mine. One was named uh, Stu and the other was, oh gosh, did I forget his name? Will, Will and Stu. These guys were as black as the ace of spades and as funny as, as all get out. And they were my best friends and we hung out all the time. Now I almost forget his name, but I'm also going back to when I was 19 years old. We got along just brilliantly because they were funny. We went to the clubs together. They took me out to a nightclub that was, they're like, you want to see what we feel like in a nightclub? And I was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you want to see what it's like to be in a, being a black dude in a white, like a country bar. He said, do you want to see what that feels like? And I'm like, I guess, sure. They invited me out to like a hip hop club. My dudes, I was the only white dude in there. <laughs> there were some white girls and Latina girls. I was the only white dude in there. I got a lot of looks. I got a lot of looks like, dude, why are you in here? It does make you very uncomfortable when you're out of your element. And so they're like, this is kind of how we feel in some parts of society today. And I'm like, okay, I get that. I get that. It's, it's good to have that mixture, to understand the way that everybody sees the world but what was most important was that we got along and that we were friends and that we had the same mindset. And I know if we got called into duty, like active, like we're, we're rolling off the plane in, I don't know, Afghanistan or something or other, I know I would take a bullet for one of those dudes and they would for me because we actually cared about each other. 
We looked out for each other and we had each other's back. You're not going to join a military where everybody, they're complaining about food and other things. Do you think that they're going to stick around to fight and actually get into it when the, you know, the proverbial crap hits the fan? Or are they going to turn tail and run, leaving you high high and dry while they dive into a foxhole and cry on TikTok about how they don't want to have to do this anymore? That's why the strong, stoic, capable people, men primarily, are not signing up for the military anymore. The smart ones are now avoiding the military because they realize, hey, this is a very quick way to get in a lot of trouble because no one's going to have my back. They're going, you know, it used to be we're looking for the few, the strong, the brave, the proud. Now it's looking, we're looking for the masses, the, you know, the LDHD or LGHD TV and the ladies and the, you know, pronouns and we're looking for you. Okay, good luck. And when things, when things get dusty, it's going to be bad. Then you look at crime statistics. You know, protest. this is from the New York Post. I'm not going to read the whole story, but pr- protesters try to swarm Daniel Penny as judge rejects motion to dismiss Jordan Neely's uh, charges, the, the case. We're going to get you, we're going to get you, Cracker. Now, this is, again, two days ago. And here you've got a guy that there was a gentleman on a train. I call him a gentleman, but he's a dude. He's a man, criminal, on the train, having a mental episode. He was having mental issues and he was threatening a woman, an elderly woman and a child. And he had hit an elderly woman before. I think he broke her jaw. The, the guy's unwell. And here you had a, a, a former military guy step up and say, hey, I'm going to restrain him. And he restrained him along with two other dudes, one of which I think was, or both of which were black. So it wasn't a white black thing. It's like, hey, this guy's a danger to people. And now they're going to try to because the, because something happened and the, the guy that was threatening everybody, you know, didn't make it. He got choked out, I guess, and to the point where he, they're going to throw this former military white guy in jail because he tried to protect other people. And then you see these stories now over the last course of the last year where people are saying woman was, you know, the struggle snuggle on a train and nobody came to help her. They, they stood and they filmed it on the phone or they ran. Why? This is why. What happens if something happens and that guy gets hurt? What happens if he has a knife and sticks me with it? And then he's going to be released from jail 12 hours later while I'm in the hospital or the morgue. No one's going to, the, the good, strong, brave men that protect society, they're not going to do anything. The good cops are leaving New York and Chicago and L.A. and San Francisco. And they're getting, I, I watched a documentary on YouTube and a guy was interviewing a cop. And, and he was, I think this was in, I want to say Chicago. Yes, it was in Chicago. And this is a cop that's been a cop for, I don't know, 30 years in Chicago. And he's saying, yeah, it's good, it's bad. And he's telling all the different things. And he said, recruiting's way down and we're losing a lot of cops. And the interviewer, the, the guy doing the documentary said, well, where are they all going? Like what's happening to them? And he said that they're, they're getting better offers from places like Florida and Texas and and uh, Tennessee and, and North Carolina and, you know, Wyoming, they, they're all leaving because they're getting better options. And they know that the people that are their supervisors and their bosses there have their back. Now, it's not to say that there's not bad cops and there's not crooked cops because there are. And I think when it really gets down to it, if a cop's worried about his paycheck or your freedom, he'll take away your freedom first before he loses his own paycheck. I don't have much love for a lot of the police force uh, after seeing, after being on the internet for the last couple of years. But I can say this, the ones that know they have a clean record and they have a family that they want to protect and, and, and take care of, they will leave for less pay in a more rural area so that they're safe and that they're respected. And the guys that maybe have shady pasts or maybe questionable, uh, maybe have a couple of dings on their, their record, they're probably not going to leave. And, and again, some of them, I'm sure, are crooked. But the whole point being that good men quit, smart men quit. Guys that, that, that are clever, that can find other options, they quit. They quit the military. They quit college. They quit police forces that don't back them up. 
They quit woke companies. They will find a way to, to find some place that will be good for them. Gen Z, this is the workforce. Gen Z workers say they should be hired for their personality, not their pr productivity. We set the vibes. They say, forget the resume. Gen Z thinks you should hire them for their personalities. That, what, are we, what are we, women now? This is how women think, by the way. I don't bring anything else to offer but my personality, but that should be enough to you. Oh, you need to have all the money and the six pack and the height and be attractive and treat me like a princess, but I have a great personality. Businesses don't care. Businesses would rather have like the weird autistic basement dweller dude that knows how to code and can do miracles in Linux. They would rather have that than somebody who says, well, I'm a marketing manager and I'm special. Don't care. You're going to get replaced by AI. Uh, this is just from a couple of months ago. Forget the resume. Uh, Gen Z thinks you'd hire them for their personalities. According to the youngest generation in the workforce, their humor and wit provides a certain vibrance older employees apparently lack. Does vibrance and wit and humor make the company money? If you're in marketing and sales, perhaps, perhaps. But if you're not, no. They say uh, they've even invented a term, personality hire, to describe their self-perceived function in a corporate setting to provide all the jokes, banter, and playfulness needed in order to set the vibes. TikToker and corporate American employee Bella Rose Mortel, a 22-year-old self-proclaimed chief vibes officer, told Business Insider that her previous managers have appreciated her energy, calling it the nicest compliment she's ever received. Okay, she's 22 and she's got previous managers, which either means she's been shuffled around departments or she's been fired. Chief Vibes Officer. This sounds like a South Park episode. That's what this is. This is a South Park episode. We are officially diving headfirst into clown world. And this doesn't make a company money, but what happens? Well, when you get a manager and the manager's good time fun, we need to like everybody and get along. And we've all got the same common goals and long-term view for our department. Are you going to be a good fit with us, Becky? Are you going to get along and be part of our crew? That's what they're getting right now. When I got hired, it was like, what do you know? Do you know this? Do you know this? Can you learn this? Can you fix this? How much, you know, here's the money. Deal, no deal. There wasn't, are we going to get, a matter of fact, we didn't get along. A lot of the engineers didn't get along. You'd hear guys in another cubicle or in another area say, no, if you do that, this is going to happen. No, blah. It was professional, but they were disagreeing. Heated. Heated. They'd get into it. And then they'd go out and ask other people what they thought. And they'd get a consensus. And at the end, the one with the most votes won the day and they did that fix. And guess what? Sometimes it didn't work. And then the other guy, they tried his and maybe it did work. And they'd say, eh, I told you. Okay, okay, we got it. But it was a learning moment. And, and at the end of the day, or even midday, those guys would still go to lunch together. I, I have a friend of mine, Matt, that, that was in, he was in a different department. But we'd have disagreements about things. And we'd have, it wasn't ever heated, but we'd get into you know, discussions on stuff. And he's like, oh, you're crazy. I'm, ah, you're crazy. Uh, what time are you going to go to lunch? I'm, I'm free around 1230. That work? Yeah. And then we'd walk over to uh, the the building that had a lunch cafeteria in the bottom. And, and we'd maybe get a, I don't know, a salad and a bite to eat. And we'd sit there and talk about it. And then we'd go back to work. And we still might disagree. We're still friends. That doesn't, there's no vibes. That's professionalism. That's respect for other people. There's no respect officer they're talking about. There's no IQ officer. There's no vibes officer. This is, this is why everything's falling apart. And, and there's no repairing these people. There's no repairing them. You don't fix somebody like this. If you grow up for 20 or 25 or 30 years, and this is the way you view the world, you don't just change at the drop of a hat. You blame corporations. You blame other people. You blame everybody else because you have zero accountability. 
that's what the latest, you know, millennials and, and Gen Z and probably Gen Alpha. And, and again, I'm not talking about all Gen Z or all, there's, but there's a ton of them. I, I mean, I'm a Gen Xer. I worked with a bunch of people that didn't take accountability for anything too. The problem is Gen X apparently raised a bunch of weirdos in the millennials. And then the millennials, which are weird, trained and raised a bunch of weird weirdos, which is Gen Z. She says, after her series of TikToks calling for an unserious workplace, the integration of Gen Z lingo into office parlance went viral. Mortel said her manager at software company Beehive found the videos hilarious. Is her, is her manager a dedicated, hardworking employee, or is, is her manager probably another woman who is, brings all, nothing to the table except good vibes? Uh, oh, now apparently it was a dude. Because in a team call yesterday, he was like, before we get started, Bella Rose, do you want to set the vibes for our call today? The social media strategist told Business Insider. Now, maybe she's lying. Maybe she's lying. Maybe he didn't really say that. Because God knows women will, women will say anything uh, to make themselves appear even better to society. Maybe, but maybe he did. And if you're the type of person that is fine with women that are like this as your employees, you're not a very productive dude either. Uh, Mort, uh, Mortel videos have been sparking realization among fellow so-called personality hires who feel their mission is to lighten things up, not lighten, not lighten someone else's workload. So they want to lighten up your they want to lighten up your day, but not lighten your workload like a good team would. Yeah, she looks just about how you'd expect. Let's stay playful together. Well, how's that turning out? From the Hill, and this is from uh, just a couple months ago, Gen Zers make difficult employees, manager says. Well, that's shocking. Uh, let's see. I am shocked. Shocked. Well, not that shocked. Gen Zers make difficult employees, managers say. Uh, three quarters of bosses, 75% of all bosses, find Generation Z workers a, a, a trifle difficult. Right. A corporate survey is, uh, survey is found. A poll of 1,344 managers and business leaders by ResumeBuilder.com found that 74% considered Gen Z employees more challenging than older staffers. Press for specifics, employers did not mince words. They think they're better than you, smarter than you, more capable than you, and they will tell you to your face, says Akpan Ukeme. Head of Human Resources as at SGK Global Shipping Services. Gen Z is the youngest cohort in the American workforce with a birth year starting around 1997. Many surveys and studies have labored to define them. The findings suggest they have not gone quietly into their cubicles. A Gallup report termed that generation disconnected noted that Gen Z is less likely than older generations to be actively engaged in work and more likely to suffer stress and burnout. So not only do they work less, not only do they not work as hard, not only do they think they know more than everybody, but th that somehow makes them more stressed and burnt out. This is the next generation coming up. These are the next people that are going to be in charge of the airlines and of the trains and of fuel and water processing and electricity and sanitation, food prep. These are the next politicians. These are the next everything. There are moments, look, I wish I could live forever. I really do. I love life. I love, I love everything that it has to offer. There is a time that is it flitting, just very flittingly crosses my mind where I'm like, I'm, I'm glad I'll probably be dead when all of this gets really bad. <laughs> I've actually thought that to myself. I actually have. I'm like, I am so glad I'm not a, a member of Gen Z, seeing everybody around me being crazy, and I'm the only sane one. That would scare me really badly. There is something nice knowing, okay, I'm 30 years older than these weirdos, so by the time it gets really bad and they're my age, I'll be like 80 or almost dead, and I'll just be, I don't know, sucking on, uh, sucking on some baby food through a straw in my, my last days on the planet. They say a study by uh, McKinsey and Company, the management consultancy, found Gen Zers rest, restless in their jobs, 
more likely to report hostile work environments and health problems, both physical and mental. Three quarters of Gen Z employees said they were actively seeking other jobs. So they're, they're in their job. They're doing nothing in their job. They think they're better than everybody else at their job. And in the meantime, they want to find another job because they're bored or they think they're better. Oh, this is going to be great. This is why I say th- it's, it's a building collapsing in on itself. It cannot stand. The corporations, the stock market, the and when the government tries to prop them all off and pay off their student loans and give the free handouts, the money printers go burr and inflation flies up. So then the interest rates have to fly up. And but if the if the money printer from the government doesn't stop, both interest and inflation will skyrocket, collapse, utter collapse. And so when we sit and say oh man, the world is burning and it's collapsing and it's all falling apart and it's all coming down. When we say that, we're not just talking about, you know, the TikTokers that are mouth breathers and stupid. We're not talking about the the only fools content creators and that, I don't know, 30% of women want to be work on spicy content and be TikTok influencers for income. That's not the stuff we're talking about. We're talking about a generation that lacks the fundamental intelligence and drive and humility and being humble to walk into a workforce, learn about it as they're a member of it, then get their raises, then become more productive and move through society, grow with their experience. No, they're coming in. They're smarter than you. They know more than you. They're bored. They hate it here. I got to look for another job. And they just keep hopping between jobs, which means nobody knows anything. Nobody is an expert at anything. No one knows what's going on. The real immigrants we probably need in this United States is not the illegals coming across the border. The the real immigrants we're going to be needing is from other countries where they have degrees that actually mean something. And the last video that I'm going to play, I'm not going to read through the rest of it. You, You get it. Top reason for these firings, Gen Z is too, these are, uh, why did they fire Gen Zers? Two thirds say they were uh, more likely to fire Gen Z workers than older staffers. Sometimes in the first week of employment. Can you imagine getting a Gen Zer and you're like, you've got to go. First week of employment. Top reasons, Gen Z is too easily offended. Too few technical skills or too many. Maybe they have technical skills not in the right area. Lack of motivation, lack of productivity, poor communication skills, a short attention span, an excessive list of entitlements. I've butted heads with more, more than once with a Gen Z employee. Since our company is online based, they think they know everything about the digital world and they can teach me. Many Gen, Gen Zers, uh, I wasn't going to read this, but I'm actually finding this interesting and I think you will too. They entered the workforce at the height of the bug. They lacked face time and human contact, a foundational moment in the careers. They may have been stunted because of the bug. These were the folks who never got the foundation other generations had. So let's not find excuses for them. It's parenting. It's the schools. It's the colleges. It's no dads in their lives. It's no one holding them accountable. That's what's going on. Uh, Employees are finding Gen Z staffers working uh, to work Report to work. Let me try that again. Employers have found that Gen Z staffers report to work brimming with ideas or ideals and ambitions. Okay, you want them showing up to work with ideas and ambition, not ideals. Ideals is not what you want. Well, here's what I think. That's not what you want. Highly innovative and adaptable, others say. They're not afraid to challenge the status quo and bring new ideas to the table. Yeah, let's see how that works. Good luck to you. Um, Yeah, the big takeaway is obviously we need to fix this. She said, Gen Z, they don't want to get their, they don't want to get fired. They're very stressed out. Okay, good luck. Good luck to you. It's all, it's all a slow, slow train wreck. And lastly, this is the gal from the thumbnail. Lastly, I'll leave it with her. She went to college. She's got the fake blonde hair. Again, you can tell because of the dark roots and the very well manicured eyebrows. And she's got mascara on. She's married, though. She's married. And she went to college. 
And she's smarter than her husband, obviously, because she went to college. What is her take on the whole work thing? So everyone pushes college, 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 and I went to college. I have a master's degree. I make very good money for my age. My husband did not go to college, and I've talked about this on here before, and I don't think you understand. I don't think you understand it, so I'm going to throw it into perspective for you, and I say it not to brag, but to hopefully help, help any of you. I have a college degree. He has a high school diploma. He went to trade school right after high school. He got his certificates and everything, and here we go. So this past July, he had already brought home, brought home, more than my gross salary this year. And that's by July. So in seven months, he's out earned her for her 12 months or her yearly salary, which roughly makes him paid, what, almost twice what she gets paid? Almost twice. No college. He went to a trade school and he got certified in whatever he does. Forklift certification. But, the, but her point stands College didn't give her, who knows what her degree's in. Maybe it's underwater basket weaving. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, gender studies marketing. It doesn't matter. She's coming out with debt and a worthless degree. And he said, I've just got a high school degree. I'm going to put my nose to the grindstone. I'm going to work hard, get my certs, and work more. And now he's already out earning her. Now, maybe he's 50 years old. I don't know. I don't know. But point still stands. He missed college, he started working, he's making the money, and he doesn't have the debt. Come December, he will have quadrupled my salary. Okay, so he makes, so by de, so if she if he's doubled her by July, she's saying basically by, by December, he'll have quadrupled four times more money than Miss College grad here got. Why is that? Because colleges don't teach you anything anymore, unless you go very specifically for like engineering. But even, or the sciences perhaps, but even like doctors, lawyers, I've heard from, from various social media posts that doctors are now told, it's not the Hippocratic Oath they're worried about of do no harm. It's more or less, we will respect those that haven't had the opportunities because of their skin color or the way they identify and all the things. That's what they're more concerned about. You, you see these colleges giving away degrees and, and letting people into college because of not their merit, but that they're women or their LGHD TV or the color of their skin. But then when they go out into the work world, you're going to get paid accordingly or you're not going to get paid. Where it, if a dude shows up and he goes, I'm a good welder. You go, okay, weld these two pieces together. Let me see what you got. And you look at it and you're like, Whew, that is a good look, looking weld. You're hired. No, oh, 100 grand a year or whatever. Yeah, you're hired. Doesn't matter if he's Latino. Doesn't matter if he's black. Doesn't matter if he's, doesn't matter if it's a woman. We need a good welder. You're a good welder. You're hired. See, when you get all this madness all wrapped up into it, and you go, okay, well, you got a liberal arts degree and this job is marketing. I mean, we can fit you in. You do have a degree. Okay, 40 grand, 50 grand a year. Because it's not a specific skill set. Everybody wants to be able to do everything, and I'm great at everything because the internet or because I'm whatever. Quadrupled it. If he decides to pick up overtime on a weekend, a two-day weekend, if he picks up overtime, he brings home that weekend, just in those two days, more than I make in a two-week check. I have a master's degree. He master's degree in what? You notice she doesn't say that. If her master's degree was in engineering, and yes, I like to go back to engineering because engineers, if you're a good engineer, people will pay for you. But if you have a master's degree in, I don't know, liberal arts or whatever, you're worthless. You're worthless. All you've been is indoctrinated into all the things. But her high school hardworking man is out earning her without any debt. This is why I keep saying college is dead because what's college filled with? It's a bunch of people that think the same way. Yay, women. Yay, diversity. Yay, whatever. Boo, white, straight men. It's kind of funny, actually, that now white gay guys are, are falling off the because there's not enough room for the platform for all the things. So now even white gay guys are like, well, I'm, they don't like me either now. 
black straight guys, they don't like me either. Like <laughs> conservative black guys, they don't like me either. Conservative Latinos, they don't like me either. The, there's only so much room at the top and all the weirdos are getting up there and shoving everybody else off the platform. He has a high school diploma. So that reason right there is why I will not push college on anyone. If you think that college is not for you and you want to try a trade school, obviously look into it. See if you think that you have what it takes. And then 100% do it. Do it. I don't think that enough people are talking about this. And it is 100% worth it if you stick with it. He's been doing it for eight years, so obviously he has made his way up the ladder. But if he leaves his job today, 100% guarantee he will make the exact same amount of money wherever else he decides to go. I cannot, I cannot stress it enough. I can't stress it enough. I am so jealous. Like, he doesn't have student debt. Nothing. And he's quadrupling my salary in one year. Now, what's the difference between her and him? Obviously, the degree. When he goes to work, is he bringing good vibes? Is he telling everybody that he knows more than they do? Is he telling them that he's already looking for another job or he's tired of being here or he's stressed out? No. What's he doing? He's showing up and he's working. He's showing up. He's busting his tail. He's good at what he does. He does the work. And then he F's off back home. The company doesn't have to worry about him. They don't have to think about him. They don't have to worry about him protesting. They don't have to worry about his social media posts. They don't have to worry about him complaining about the company. They don't have to worry about him showing TikToks of him sitting around and eating and doing nothing all day. They don't have to think about him at all. He does the work we require. We give him a check. Done. Business arrangement completed. What about her? Here she is on social media, complaining, complaining about her money, complaining about her degree, complaining about her. No, she, she's not really complaining about her husband. And she says he's been doing it for eight years. So if, and he has no degree straight out of high school. So let's say let's say that makes him 18 years old. He's been doing it for eight years. He's 26. She's probably right around that age, 24, 25, 26. If she, if she did a master's degree, bachelor's is four years. So master's is six years if she just plowed through at the age of 18. So from 18 to, to 24, six years, she went and got her master's degree. And now she's been working for two years and she's making probably good money, but he's making amazing money. Why? Because he put, he put his stuff into certifications and then worked for the, for the six years she was in college. So the day she gets out of college and maybe gets her first job, she says, well, I have this degree. And they say, how much experience do you have? She says, none. What about her husband? He got the certs. And then he's got eight years of experience under his belt of actual real world experience. That makes him a lot more qualified than whatever work he's doing. And he started, I bet he started at 18 while in trade school or getting a certification. He started at 40 grand, but he was good at what he did. And so he got a raise and then a raise and then a, probably a position bump. Maybe he works overtime. Maybe, maybe just busts his butt to make that money. And, and now he's got eight years under his belt and he's probably going to be ready for another positional raise. What she got debt and she learned nothing, nothing. And when did colleges become like this? I saw a graph and it, it showed the, the, where the money was going in college and like the number of faculty at college and things like that. The, the student line just slowly increased over the years. Just, you know, from like if it said five, it went up to like six or seven. I don't remember the metrics they were using on the scale, but it was a graph. And, and the students went from this much to this much by the end of the graph. It barely moved. The faculty went like this right off the chart. It used to be, you know, like one faculty per 30 students. Now it's 30 faculty per one student. It's overhead. It's a giveaway program. 
because everybody says, well, we need to make this new department to do this new worthless thing so we can get more women and more diverse people on board. Okay, talk about top heavy. Talk about top heavy. And the whole thing is going to collapse. It'll collapse, it'll collapse with the economy. It'll collapse with the money printing. It'll collapse with giving useless people useless jobs at corporations run by useless people, which is what you see here with the airlines. It's what you see with the military. It's what you see with all the things. It's all going to come crashing down. And when it does, just be prepared. That's why I think you better be, you better know what you're doing. <laughs> at least be able to square yourself away. It's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm uh, at least through the coldest of winter. Now, I haven't had enough time to, to go out on my land and cut up firewood. If I pre pre prepared enough firewood for my building, I could keep my dog warm. I probably should have gotten a bigger stove, but I could put more insulation in there. I could, I could get, but I, I wasn't prepared for this winter, but that's a good lesson. I didn't know what was going to happen this winter because it's my first winter in Tennessee um, uh, in that metal building because that got built last March. And I learned a lesson. I learned I need more insulation in this building. I should have gotten a bigger stove, but more insulation will probably fix that. I might have to overdo the insulation just to fix it. And I've got a concrete floor all the way across that garage. So in some small section, I might want to put down two inch, um, two inch foam insulation and then put my floor on top of that with with a two by four three quarter inch ply two by four half inch ply two by four and a laminate floor then my floor is insulated the rest of the building's in, uh, insulated because now whether it's summer or winter when i hit that floor with a laser thermometer it tells me it's anywhere between 55 and 62 degrees in the summer it's nice it keeps the building cooler but in the winter time it sucks let me tell you but i learned that lesson from doing it from living in that building, from, from being in the experience. And then you learn and then you adapt. But that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to live out of that building off firewood and using solar and batteries and collecting rainwater to drink and figuring out how I'm going to shower in the middle of the winter. And I had to come out with, with those ideas because at some point, it's some, whether it's five years, three years, 20 years, at some point, these are the people that are in charge of everything. And it all comes crumbling down because they can't figure it out anymore. So do you have a backup plan where you're at least, you can at least rely upon yourself and not all the other people? That's what matters the most, if you ask me. Guys, if you're uh, just here on YouTube, please become a supporter today over on betterbachelor.locals.com. Huge group of like-minded men. Got a great community. We've got a gilded server. We game. We do live streams on the weekends. Really great group of guys. So if you'd like some some more human interaction with like-minded guys. Hop on over, become a supporter, get on those forums, join us over on the Gilded server, which is very much like Discord, just a different company that's not quite as woke. And uh, I hope you uh, join us over there and we'll see you in the next one.